Two years ago, Leeds United secured a ninth place finish in the Premier League and the giant club looked on their way back, but a series of mistakes thereafter have led them straight back to the Championship and to a point straight back to square one. But they've appointed Daniel Farker. There's been a takeover this in the offing this summer. Changes afoot and can Leeds United bounce back at the first time of asking and get their, their club back where they feel they deserve to be. And to discuss all these things and more, I'm delighted to be joined by Ryan Owen, who's a Leeds United supporter. How are you, Ryan? <laughs> yeah. yeah, life's good. I think I was just saying off air before we started that uh, it's... um. It's nice. It's nice to be back. It, it, it's a bigger pool of clubs to uh, to sort of think about now. And you, and you naturally, once you're in the championship, you start thinking about League One a bit more as well. Not that I hope we end up there, but you're just sort of back in the the wider pool of EFL fandom, which is nice. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully League One is still very much a distant memory for, for Leeds United. But uh, <laughs> yes, no, no, I, I, I take your point. And it's uh, it's certainly lovely, um, I, I think, in one sense, that to be part of these these leagues, which are so competitive. Um, before we get into the League Leeds United chat, just a bit of a public service announcement. I'm covering all 72 clubs across the EFL on EFL Debate with the Summer di Deep Dives. We're also available on YouTube and on Spotify. And if you're watching or listening to this on either of those platforms, then do give us a subscribe because that would help us out a lot. And check out the other videos once you're done with this one. Um, Ryan, before we look at the challenges ahead of Leeds United and the Championship, just talk us through the last couple of years and the mistakes that have been made to, to get Leeds to this point. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. There have been mistakes made since promotion. I think that's naturally where you end up. I mean, I think it is important to say first and foremost that just I'm, with time having passed from relegation occurring, you you do sort of think in a little bit more calmer fashion about what's gone on. And the promotion in and of itself was impressive. You know, the club spent money to get there you know we're not no one's denying that they, they spent a bit of money on Bamford and Hyder Costa and a few other players when they were down in the championship but they did incredibly well and they did that with a great manager you know regardless of what people from the outside think of Bielsa and how it ultimately ended at Leeds the football that was played to get there and the football that was played in the early parts of the Premier League um, was sublime sublime with the players that he had available to him. Um, you're in a league once you get there that is totally unforgiving. That there is a, There's a top seven or now with Newcastle as well that is far beyond your means in terms of personnel. So you're essentially playing in a bottom 13 league at best. And even within that, there are clubs that have established themselves in the Premier League and and are doing quite well for themselves. Brighton, um, I would say, really have been far beyond where we've been, um, for example. So mistakes have been made, but I think it came apart at the seams when we got a few key injuries under Bielsa, um, first and foremost. And that's when some of the panic set in with the board because the board started to realize that their investments might not be worth as much and you know relegation poses that financial sort of doom on the club um that's not to not to sort of get into a debate now about whether or not it was right to get rid of bielsa but bielsa's system was so unique that once you took out phillips to an injury and you took out bamford to an injury and you took out the spine really of what was essential to make that tick it started to look very messy um, and the players themselves were never good enough to play without his system in place. That's my view. They mm. weren't good enough to just go out with a, with a manager that didn't have such a sort of, his system was so idealistic and so impregnated in their minds that they needed everything that he had taught them in order to perform at the level that they were performing at the cracks start to show the club brought in a manager that they thought clearly was a natural progression from Bielsa and therein lies the first problem 
<laughs> because it became really clear, Gab, that Jesse Marsh was not a natural progression from Bielsa in any real sense other than Jesse Marsh likes his players to run around a lot and put in a lot of hard work. Well, there was far more to Marcelo Bielsa than running around and putting in a lot of hard work. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, this was it. a ma- you know, this this guy had Stuart Dallas and players that were previously considered to be sort of middle of the road championship players. Luke Ayling. Oh, he had them in a classroom in the first summer, learning X's and O's beyond what any of them had ever thought about before. And I think they'd probably accept that if you spoke to them. So to rip all that out from them, bring in a manager that was completely different. He, he liked a very narrow style, as has been reported, um, Jesse Marsh. But really, it was put. It was like watching rugby league. It was push the ball forward and then lose the ball and run after the ball to try and win it back higher up the pitch and then have a shot. Except it was never... it was like watching rugby league with a shooting accuracy. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, every, everything just completely. It, that's the way I, I keep saying rip to part of the seams. But it's like all of a sudden you realise just how average these players in the main were. I mean, they had a couple of special players. They had Rafinha previously, and Rafinha was absolutely superb, but he'd gone. Um, they signed Sinistera, who was trying his best um, to sort of plug the gaps with some serious quality, and he is quality, but he was getting injured every other week. So they just never... The appointment of Jesse Marsh, in my opinion, and I think probably the opinion of a lot of fans, that was the real... It, it just couldn't they couldn't get it back from there. They couldn't get it back. And then when they decided that they didn't want him, it was ripped apart even further. It's like they they completely ripped it. And then they said, right, we want Gracia to come in and just sort of play pragmatic football. But if you play pragmatic football with players that are not as good as the opposition, then you're probably going to lose quite a lot of matches because the opposition will play... Maybe even if they're playing pragmatic football, they'll do it better than you because they've got better players. And it, it just completely, no, I, I, th- I think that's fair to say. We could go further and talk about recruitment as well, as I'm sure we'll get mm. into, because recruitment has been a big reason um, behind why it's gone to part. Yeah, well, I'm sure we'll touch on that, but I, I w- want to throw it forward as well, because um, one of the concerns that I've got in the sense that you've, you had a very stats-based um, recruitment strategy in the past, and a lot of it was based on running stats and presses per defensive action, which is all very well. But if the players can't pass or shoot, then that's obviously a, a bit of a problem. And I have a concern that you've got a group of players that have been recruited for a very intense, high-octane, energetic style of football, and you've now appointed a manager who likes um, lots of technical footballers like he had at Norwich. Daniel Farker had, um, you know, technicians like Mario Rancic and Mo Leitner in midfield who are very different types of players to the ones that Leeds have been recruiting. I can't really see that there's a lot of areas in this current squad where I think is Daniel Farker necessarily going to... Um, he might have to do what Bielsa did in terms of find new technical layers in some of those players as opposed to... Because he might not be able to find all the solutions in recruitment. It's a, it's a good question. I mean, recruitment was, you're right, recruitment seemed to be largely based around pressures and and the ability to pressure the ball. Um, we ended up with a lot of players, I hate singling players out, but the likes of Dan James and uh, the likes of, well, he's a, he is a great example. There are others, but he was, sent, uh, Brendan Aronson, another very, very quick, very uh, fit um come across sort of more maybe of sign them for their sprinting ability than for their football ability. And I agree with that. Um, It's not to say they don't have any technical ability, but Mm. I think I, I, there's something to be said in what you're saying is, is the whole club aligned now? Um, Well, it's bound not to be in a sense because we have new owners. We have currently no um, director of football or to left and we're still well I say we have new owners we're still in the process of having those owners ratified by the EFL and mm. it looks like they'll probably go after Stuart Weber from Norwich and maybe some conversations have gone he, he's leaving Norwich and he can't sign until September and so on and so forth um, the good news in one sense from what you're saying 
is that we don't really have any central midfielders at the minute. So if central midfield is the area that you're concerned about and you think recruitment needs to be aligned D with Darko, Daniel Sparks, Diaby, um, you've got a couple of, <laughs> couple of them. We have, da we have Darko Giabi and Tyler Adams that I yeah. could see playing in if Adams stays. I mean, he is mm. captain of the USA, so he may angle for a move, although there's whispers this week he might stay. Um, okay. Mark Rocker is probably off to Real Betis on loan. It hasn't really worked out for him. Um, See, he was actually one, um, sorry to jump in on there, Ryan, but he was actually one that I thought might be able to fit into Farka style because he was one of those that was asked to play probably a different game than actually his strengths are. And I think Farka's probably the type of manager, ironically, that might be able to get the best out of that. But if he's out on loan, then... Well, he, it's not confirmed. And as, as you're saying that, Farka came through the door um, earlier last week um, and actually some of the whispers on Rocker going to Betis have gone slightly quiet. So that I suppose there is a chance that Fark has come in the door, had a look at what he's got and, and maybe liked Rocker. And, you know, I, I do think there's a danger that we throw all of the uh, the baby out with the bathwater slightly. Um, it's good to say um, X, Y and Z are not quite good enough or you don't fit the style, so we're going to try and sell you. But it, but it isn't necessarily good, as hopefully Bielsa taught us, to just say, well, 50% of this squad is rubbish, see you later, because the truth is probably that they're not rubbish and maybe Mark Rocker is one of those. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And and hopefully Fark is able to do some of what Bielsa did in terms of coaching new layers in players, which I felt like I saw a little bit last season with um, Cody Drama when he was on loan at Luton. Um, he's always been a real athlete, but I think under Rob Edwards at Luton, he acquired the ability to maybe drift in field and maybe just add more nuanced elements to his game. I think uh, Farker might see something of Max Aaron's or Aaron's as he's um, as he's pronounced in in Cody Drama. So I'm wondering if you feel like you're excited about what he to see what he can do in the championship again. Yeah, I mean, you will ironically you will have seen more of Drama than me um, over the mm. last couple of years. Um, but I think the only way that he would be willing to stay and not be tempted by a move to Luton or Burnley, who are, who are sort of mooted to be after him would be if he was guaranteed a, a significant amount of playing time. And given that Luke Ayling, um he signed a one-year extension, but his legs went from under him last year. Now, obviously, the the competition level is dropping slightly, and you'd hope that Ayling can offer something in the squad this year and certainly a good character to have around the place. But I think Cody Drama will be the starting right back, and I'd be surprised if he wasn't under Farker, to be quite honest. I am excited to see him. He's picked up a lot of experience at Luton um, and the uh, previous loan Cardiff. spell at Cardiff. So, yeah, I, I think he's one that should be around. Um, there seem to be certain areas of the squad that look strongish. Um, I mean, our wingers are there in abundance. We seem to have about 20 wingers and we talk about where, recru where recruitment's gone wrong. I mean... <laughs> I don't half of them maybe they thought were strikers, but they're not strikers and they're actually wingers and none of them can actually play in the middle. They all have to play wide. I mean, between Somerville, Rutter, Dan James, Harrison, Luis Sinistera, Willie Nonto, that's six really more than able champion. <laughs> I mean, some of them should not be really strutting their stuff in the championship, but thinking particularly of Sinistera and Nonto. Nonto, um, yeah. I've, I've heard yeah. Nonto is supposed to be worth 40-odd million, something like that. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how they play that, really. I mean, it's all right saying he's worth 40 million, and I hope he is if that if they sell him. I hope that's what they get. But given that they only got 50 or so for, for Rafinha and, and sort of only got... You know, yeah, they've not always been the best. Uh, you know, it's part of the strategy is they sort of viewed themselves through the Orta years and uh, Radrazani years as being this club that picks up talent at a reasonable price and sells it on at a mm. higher price. They've not always done a great job of it. They've sort of signed the player but never been able to be that good at the selling negotiation. Um, so I'll be interested to see what happens and if they can convince him to stay. Um, it would be in, I mean, at championship level, um, Willie Nonto would be special. And to be honest, Luis Sinistera would probably be even more special, in my opinion, if he stays fully fit. Um, but I, I just, 
there's a bit of me that just thinks, how are they going to convince this Colombian international to stay? But uh, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, stranger things have happened. So, so we'll see on that one. Uh, what would you say will be the best positions for Nonto and Sinistera? Well, so as I was planning for our discussion, I sort of think, well, we've got way too many left wingers. I mean, Nonto has looked best off the left and probably Sinistera has looked best off the left. But of course, we also have Jack Harrison. I mean, you... you if we were starting tomorrow, they'd probably start Harrison. So what do you do with these other two? I mean, it's, it's like Spartacus. I'm best on the left. <laughs> it is. It is a bit. I mean, Sinistera did play some football off the right wing um, and they could play him there. I mean, it seems likely that they're going to send. There's a lot of interest in Crescencio Somerville. Um, so they, they may sell Somerville. They're going to have to sell someone. Um at least one of those six that I've mentioned. I mean, it, it is bit, it's a bit silly to have so many good wingers, and you can't please them all. Inevitably, if you keep them, you, you, you're going to have one or two quite upset players sitting on mm. the bench in the championship. It, it's not going to work for squad dynamics. <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah. we've got no left back, really. <laughs> no, no. Uh, it, the squad build, as, as you can see, as we continue to talk, the building of this squad has been slightly chaotic yeah it's um you do wonder about um about that and whether actually it might be best to cash in on someone like willie nonto for 30 40 million and use some of that money to uh, to reinvest because it feels to me even though looking through the squad notionally there's a lot of players there it's difficult for me to put together a potential starting 11 because there's so many areas that look um that look a bit dry um so how many more additions do you think i need to between now and the end of the window well the club are talking about, I think it's going to have to be about five players that are starters or very close to being starters. And, it, and it, if we, it depends on who we keep, obviously, but it looks, we certainly need a left back because I think if the club are done with Brendan Aronson, then they're definitely done with Junior Furpo. I would be absolutely shocked if they started Junior Furpo. Aronson can play left back, can he? No, I just mean the club have already loaned Brendan oh, Aronson see. out, um, that he's gone to Union Berlin. They seem to be identifying players that either are on too high of a wage and therefore they want them gone, or they don't like very much and therefore they're gone. And they're doing it quite quickly. And most of these sales are happening as loans. Rumour has it that Orta put some clauses in their contracts to sort of uh, said, if we get relegated, you are entitled to a loan or whatever it may be. So, But my point more is that They've identified Lorente's gone, Cox gone, Aronson's gone. They've all gone out on loan. I would imagine Furpo is very high up the list, but it might be difficult to find a taker, to be honest. Um, are, so, are their wages, sorry, are their wages all being paid for? Because I, I, it feels like it's a little bit maybe not great that you're, you're not getting the benefit of having these players in the squad, and yet you're not actually getting a transfer fee for them. It's a so, fair question. I think there's an, I think there's two... That's mainly what fans are a little bit upset about in some ways. I think there's two things. One, can you find a buyer? I mean, in, in Diego Lorente's case, if you found a buyer on a permanent contract, we paid 15 million for him, you'd probably be looking at less than five. I mean, maybe even two. He's really not been great. Having said that, he is off to Roma. He played a few games for them. But I think there's an element of let's just get all of his wages off the wage bill and let's do it quickly. I don't think the club want, the way I view it, why would they logically be doing this? They could hold out for a transfer fee. No, we want him off the wage bill. We want him gone now. The squad's too big. And if we hold out and we wait through transfer negotiations, we've got a disgruntled Diego Lorente around the place mm. that clearly wants to be in Italy. So I think they are taking a slight financial hit to get people off the wage bill and to get them out of the building, to be quite honest. Mm. And I think with new owners in place, they naturally want to build their own squad with Farker and probably with Weber if he comes in. Um, yeah. I take your point. I do yeah. take your point. Maybe Aronson's slightly different because Aronson is very young and he really just needs to bulk up and... He was not. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I, as as much as I've probably slagged off some of the recruitment, I would probably say that 
you know, I find it hard to believe that Brendan Aronson couldn't have made a difference in the championship. Maybe I'm completely wrong about that and he wouldn't. But I, I, I feel like he's one of those players. So when you're loaning someone out, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I think I, he's the probably of the three that have already gone. He's the one that maybe you think, well, we paid good money for him. Maybe he would have been all right. But mm-hmm. having said that, the, the lack of physicality that Brendan Aronson showed in the Premier League it's okay saying, well, you're dropping down to the championship. You should be better down here. But we've been in the championship before and he does look physically, he looks like someone that would get completely mugged off in the championship. And I I get that the level goes down, but you're still playing against men. You know, you go to Rotherham, you're still going to be playing against 30-year-old men that are bigger than you. And he's a good player, Aronson. He's got some ability. I think the loan move, I think it's the right time. And Okay. okay. That's that's well, my opinion. Sure. Um, yeah. Are, 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 we, we need to answer your initial question. We need a left back. Yeah. We need a right sided centre back because we only have Charlie Cresswell. I mean, again, in terms of squad build, this is a joke. I mean, on the left hand side of centre half, we have Liam Cooper, Pascal Struick, Maximilian where, where, do you, sorry, where do you think Liam Cooper's at at the moment? Because he's one that I instinctively think he should be good in the championship. He's a Leeds United stalwart, you know, but I, I, I've i not watched him as, at close because, you know, you've obviously been in the Premier League. So what's his form been like in recent seasons? It's so, In terms of the defence, I think it's really hard to talk about form because the squad as a whole has been such a mess for <laughs> nigh on two years that, that all the defence have looked bad. But... He has lost a, a yard of pace, and I'd be shocked if Struick and and certainly uh, Max Wober um, weren't ahead of him in the pecking order. So I think Cooper, a little bit like um, Ailing, is one of those that's in the squad, and he's really handy to have in the building, and you'd, you'd plug him in if you needed him. But I don't really think that he's a, a bona fide starter. Right? And if Wober stays, then he'll um, he'll be in the lineup. But they've got four left-sided centre-halves. They've got Cooper, Struick, Wober and Yelder, who was on loan at Rotherham. Um, yeah. And they've got Charlie Cresswell coming back from Millwall on the right-hand side. They've loaned out Lorente and Cox. So they yeah. need a right side. You, you know, you could put Cresswell also- in. Playing, playing the devil's advocate, Ryan. We don't. We no one ever bats an eyelid when there's there's two right-footed centre halves, but when there's two left-footed, it always feels unusual because left. Who are you trying to make me imagine playing like Cooper and Wober <laughs> centre half? You try, you're trying to give me like nightmare. It's a Sunday night. Well, I just want to go to bed. <laughs> not necessarily. I think just in terms of the left-footed uh, nature, I feel like we we often sort of find it. Unusual that left foot two you have two left footers at centre back yeah. where two right footers it's like it's just I'm not normal. totally against that. I agree with what you're saying in premise, but just having watched those four players, I mean Struick turns like a stagecoach bus going around a, a roundabout. Um, you know, I mean I like Struick, but he's a I can't imagine him playing on the right hand side of defence just because of how left footed he is and just mm. he's a little bit static. His agility isn't there. There's okay. no agility in Cooper at this moment in time. I mean, he's getting on. So, you, I, I don't know. I'm a, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe one what's, of them will prove me it, wrong. How's Verba getting on? Yeah, he's well liked. Um, he came in and did a decent job. He's good on the ball. Um, he needs to prove fitness a little bit. He had a few niggling injuries. Um but he looks a good player. I mean, he's an Austrian international and he's quite... Um, I could see Farker liking him because he's good yeah. on the ball as well. And I think he'll be able to step out into... He was at Ajax as well, wasn't he, earlier in his career? Yeah, um, I could. He, I can imagine um, Farker will like Yelder as well, actually. Um, he's a bit younger, but he's. Uh, I think he mm-hmm. looks a decent talent. But there's rumours of Nat, Phillip, Nat Phillips on... Um, the right hand side, um, yeah, whether see, that be a loan or a purchase, I don't know. He he's one I don't think would fit into the FAC system. I think that you know if you appoint Daniel FAC, you need to have ball playing defenders, and I'm not sure that Nat Phillips is necessarily that. So um, yeah, I'm not, be... and I'm not sure that Cresswell is. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting because the guy they've got doing recruitment is the chap temporarily doing it whilst they wait on probably. Um, Weber. Um, mm. He was at Newcastle um, and he brought in temporary signings at Newcastle. Um, so yeah. it'd be interesting to see 
how this goes. And of course, these are just rumours at the minute. I don't know whether Phillips is someone that Farker wants or not. Um, but there's a hole there. There's a hole at left back. The rumour at left back is Ryan Manning, who's a free mm. agent. Um that would make sense, but I would imagine competition will be fierce for him because he had a good season last year at Swansea. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a lot to do, and we're kicking off in less than four weeks. Mm. Yeah, a lot a lot of work to do. I think I agree with you on uh, on Ryan Manning. I think that would make a lot of sense. He's a very technical uh, left back, and I think when um, Farkas Norwich side won the title at this level in 1819 they had max Aarons, who was the one who was really attacking the flank and being really athletic and attacking the byline and then they had um jamal lewis who was a bit a little bit more cautious and good link up play but wasn't you know wasn't super direct and i reckon that there's it's possible that manning could do a similar job to jamal lewis and cody drama could could be a bit like Aaron. so i think there's some positivity from that point of view if if manning uh, does does sign um but then you've got the goalkeeping situation as well, because Ilian Ilya Meslier is uh, supposedly off. Um, are you looking at recruiting a new number one as well? Well, again, this is a weird situation because Meslier or Melier, well, yeah, the idea is seemingly that you know his time is up and the club are not going with Melier anymore, and he struggled at the back end of last year. Yeah, he did. But one. You know, one year ago, this is a guy that they wouldn't have taken less than 15, 20 million for. He was a young star on the verge of breaking into the French national team, best French young goalkeeper. In the... He has a few, uh, a bad second half of the season in a team that was completely crumbling, to be quite honest. Um, and now they're just, what, are they just going to loan him out somewhere again? And I, I don't really understand personally where the benefit is for Legion United. Um, or really for Melier, other than to maybe just get out of the firing line because Ellen Road can become a little bit, uh, you know, unpleasurable <laughs> at times. So <laughs> personally, I would, you know, they can't just go in with Melier and Classen, I don't think, because Classen's quite young. They would need a, a veteran. Um, but I, I can't help but feel it just takes Daniel Farker to put an arm around the guy and say, mm -hmm. okay, you had a bad time of it after Christmas, but you did get the, the club prom promoted and you did have a good first season in the Premier League and you're only 23 years old and yeah. we're not selling you for two million. It's not happening. You're, you're talented. Yeah. So there's elements of his game that need to improve. He struggles with um, some of his footwork. He seems to struggle from direct free kicks massively. <laughs> Every time there's a direct free kick coming in, I, I, I worry because he doesn't seem to move properly. But I don't. I can't help but feel this isn't some terrible goalkeeper all of a sudden. Um, yeah. That's my. The plenty of Leeds fans that would disagree, I'm sure, and want rid. And there's rumours of um, yeah Angus Gunn, and there's rumours of Carl mm. Darlow, and you know yeah. Maybe, I, you know. I, I think there's a lot of recency bias in football, and I actually I think we actually see the smartest clubs don't necessarily recruit the the hot trendy players that have had a good 12 months they're actually able to assess a player's bigger picture and sometimes they're able to look past the last 12 months i think that's that perspective is really important so yeah I, th I think you could be right about melier but he's probably gonna have to improve his distribution um if for for a daniel fark side because again center back goalkeepers distribution is going to be really important Yes, no, I agree with that. But it's nothing that Bielsa wasn't asking him to do. Um, you know, yeah. he, he will be absolutely used to a coach trying to improve him on that in that regard. The difficulty comes that he's had Sam Allardyce for two months telling him just to hoof it or sit on the bench, you know. So <laughs> that that's it just I think there's a confidence thing with Melier. Um mm -hmm. as it stands, it does look like the club are gonna maybe panic, get rid of him and bring someone in a bit more experienced. Mm -hmm. That's up to the club. I, personally, I think that's uh, yeah. shoots, shoots See, I'm, I'm not convinced Carl Darlo is necessarily going to be a huge upgrade on on Melier. I'd probably, yeah, I'd, I'd probably rather keep hold of it. Dep it depends how much money you could get for him, but uh, it does. If if it, if it if they're selling him based on one bad season, you wonder if that might be a little bit hasty. Um, tell you about another position I'm interested in, Ryan, which is the second striker role. Um, uh, when Farka when Farker's Norwich side won the title at this level, again, I'm kind of going back to that as the template, they had a really physical, uh, aggressive second striker that played just off the main uh, the main front man. 
and um, who would often win a few things in the air as well. I'm just wondering if you've got that player in the current squad or whether you feel like it's something you're going to have to... I, yeah, I mean, do you think you're going to have to recruit for that or...? Playing just... I mean, who played there for Norwich? Uh, do you know, the, the names just escaped me. It was like yeah. a, a... I think he began with the, the letter S, but I can't remember. I think they signed him the year before. John, I'm gonna yeah, have there's, some, there's someone in the back of my head and I can't bring it to the forefront either. Um, yeah. OK, um, do so sort of in that sort of attacking yeah. midfield role behind the striker. Is... Marco, Marco Steeperman, that's the one. I'm, that's yeah. the name I'm after, yeah. 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 No, I don't think we have that person in the squad. <laughs> and and that, that area of the squad has been a problem ever since. I mean, Pablo Hernandez is not Steeperman, um, but that's the sort of pocket of space that Hernandez used to to occupy and sure. we have never ever replaced Pablo Hernandez. I mean, A is an incredibly difficult player to replace because he's an absolutely superb footballer. Um but they spent big money in that first season going up to the Prem on Rodrigo. Um and it seems as though Orta and the board felt like he could play that role. And indeed they tried him there. It it never worked. I mean he he um he couldn't press. In fact, interestingly, they signed all these players that could press and, and he couldn't. They bought him for his technical ability, maybe with the dream of him floating around there and pinging passes and scoring and physically never matched up to that role. Um, and it just never worked. They've tried all sorts behind there since. I mean, in fact, you might even say that Tyler Roberts was better at that than than... Rodrigo, you know, um, Roberts has gone off to Birmingham and I wouldn't have kept him. I'm not suggesting that, you know, he's gone off to Birmingham, but he's had his injury problems and it never quite worked for him. They have Joe Gellhart, who some might say, well, maybe you could try Joe Gellhart in that role, but mm -hmm. he fits into this role of, is he a striker? Is he an attacking midfielder? Is he a winger? And we're not sure when he's quite small. Yeah, he, he certainly like... one, I think certainly one for a front two. Maybe he could play as a second striker. Um, Maybe. Possibly. How tall is, is Gellhart? Is he about six foot or something? No, he, he never comes across as looking especially tall to me. Um, um, maybe he's short. Yeah, um, he's quite stocky, um, but I don't think he's especially tall. And he, he's better in the air than you think. He does win a few headers. Um, mm. And he is talented. Um, but I'm not, again... It's up to the club. I, mean, I think that's an area that they need to target in terms of recruitment. Um, I really do. Um, 100%. Yeah. Let's let's see who they uh, they go for. And then, of course, we have the question mark of uh, what's going to happen up top, because instantly as a you know, championship follower, I sort of look at Patrick Bamford and think, you know, he's a pretty safe bet at this level. But obviously, you know, a lot's changed in the last couple of years. And certainly he's no longer in the uh, the England equation. You signed Rodrigo in January. Um, and that probably was one that didn't quite work out. And I'm just looking at the other options you've got now. Um, you've got Jorginho Ruta. Um, obviously, Willie Nonto could play up top. Joe Gelhart could play up top. Um, do you think you'll be in the market for another striker? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's there's debate on this. I mean, Bamford splits opinion. Um, it feels to me like fans that have been there since his start at Leeds and have really sort of stuck by him and tried their best to um, have some patience. Um, I feel sorry for Patrick Bamford in the sense that he hasn't been fully fit for well over a year now, probably getting on for two years. And yet the club has never really bought a traditional number nine to take some of the weight off his shoulders. He's been rushed back every single time. He's had foot injuries. He's had problems with his calves. And every time he is the man that's been asked to come and hold the ball up and link up play. He's very good at that. He's quite quick as well, Patrick Bamford. You know, he, But he played out of his skin for Bielsa for two years and he's suffering. I think the club definitely need a target man that can hold the ball up, that can play up top, that can score goals, that can do some of that hard work that isn't Patrick Bamford. Because I would suggest that if we don't sign that replacement within a month of the season starting, Patrick Bamford will be in the injury room and we'll be having the debate of who's going to play up top. Will it be Joe Gellhart? Will it be Ruta? Will it be Nonto? 
Will it be Dan James? And none of them are number nines. Yeah. You know, so the rumours at the minute are, you know, they're looking at Sam Surridge at um, Forest, um, who I must admit I haven't watched much of other than their promotion season. I saw him coming on, on and off the bench a little bit for them. I don't mm. know much about him. Sure. Um, you probably do. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of in two minds. I saw someone on the forum saying it seemed like quite an underwhelming signing. And in a way, I I can sort of see why, because he's not someone who's got a prolific goal-scoring record at championship level. And I would probably naturally thought of him as someone more likely to go to a playoff outsider rather than a side like Leeds that are sort of expecting to challenge for the automatics. Um, are we? Even after this discussion, we have no goal lead. <laughs> left back no right side <laughs> no striker yeah no, no uh, when you put it like that um I, I suppose i'm thinking that expectations at leeds are always going to be high at this level um i think that he's an athletic center forward someone that's um that's gonna that's very good in the air he's six foot four i think it is um brilliant in the air real uh real workhorse as well i think he's someone who could coming off the bench a few times to give Bamford a rest, possibly start 10, 15 games. Uh, so someone to kind of rotate with Bamford. I don't know if his link-up play is going to be as refined as Bamford's, and I would worry a little bit that when you rest Bamford or if he gets injured or um, that there's a slight drop-off and the dynamics of the team change a little bit. So that would be a slight concern for me. Uh, but I, I could see him doing a job, but I'm not, not 100% sure on that one. Yeah, it's an intro. I'm glad that I'm on because you've given insights of players. And you've got great knowledge of it, uh, Gab. Um, it depends where the club goes with how they want to spend money. Um, we, we're not seeing them sign anyone yet because we're waiting on EFL ratification. Of course, the other big name that's been spoken about, I say big name, I'm not sure Sam Surridge is a big name, but um, the other name that's been spoken about is Joel Pirot at Swansea. But it does feel like prying him out of Swansea will be a bit of a premium and we won't be the only club again. And it's not to say we can't get the deal done because you're quite right. We've got parachute payments and we're getting a load of players off the wage bill. So there's probably money to be spent. But where do you want to put most of your eggs? Do you, do you want to, to to put them all into a, a new number nine and sort of tell... If you sign Pirot, you are basically telling Patrick Bamford that he's on the bench. Mm. Yeah, possibly. Um, it's going to be fascinating I think. to see... Who yeah, no, I think it's going to be fascinating to see who Leeds go for. And it look, it feels like a really important decision over Patrick Bamford because who Leeds sign is probably going to be quite an indication as their stance on Patrick Bamford. Um, how are you feeling about the club generally at the moment, Ryan? Because there was a lot of um, anger, I suppose, at Ellen Road after the uh, the relegation. or uh, And it feels like fans feel a little bit disconnected from their club at the moment. Um, how do you feel as, as a Leeds fan? I'm always like, I, I have my own perspectives and I suppose I don't speak, I can't speak for the whole fan base. So that's the first thing. There are fans that are very disillusioned at the minute and there are fans that were apoplectic about um, Radrazani and, and the way that things went towards the end. Um, I personally, I think Radrazani probably was in it to make money. Um, and probably did make a little bit of money, although not as much as he would have liked. If we'd stayed up, he'd have sold us for more. Um, but the fact that he made money at Leeds means that we we are a... I talk about big clubs, I don't like that. We are financially a, a, a bigger club than we were when Radrazani bought the club. Um, it goes to show that if he's made a profit, then the club has obviously grown in the time that he was um, made chairman. So I'm quite calm in the sense that we're in a better position upon this relegation than we were upon our previous relegation. You know, we have the safety of parachute payments, which Leeds United have never received before. This will be our first year of parachute payments in our history. Um, so that'll help. Um, and I, I think probably the new owners have good intentions as well. I, you know, I don't, I don't view any of it as having been a, uh, owners that I think I think I become disillusioned if I feel like the owners don't have the best interests of the club and, and the football at heart. Do you think, think Radrazani's had the best interests of the club and the football at heart? I think he's probably at the forefront of his mind had the best interest of Radrazani at, at heart. You know, he, he does come across as a businessman. Um but I, th I, I you know I think 
having said that, it's not like they didn't spend any money. I mean, it, you know, they went up. They spent thirty million on Rodrigo. They spent fifth. They've spent it not overly wisely, in my opinion. And they became a bit giddy. And I think where he fell down is he became too wedded to Victor Orta. I think maybe. I think maybe Orta. Um, I think Orta might be a particular niche as a director of football. He seems to be quite good on a budget but not as good once you give him a hundred million and say, can you go and get me players that are good enough for the Prem? I, I, I think maybe he's got a little bit lost with, uh, with the giddiness yeah. of it all. I'll I tell you my concern about it, Ryan, which is when Marcelo Bielsa came in, in order to attract a, a manager of Marcelo Bielsa's um, stand, standing in the game, they had to agree to a lot of his demands and a lot of them were agreeing to certain structural changes, including things like um, revamping the training ground. There were certain things that Bielsa wanted as part of the deal. Um, I think when Bielsa went, what worries me is that there seemed to be a massive neglect of structural issues at the football club. And I've heard stories on you know, podcasts like The Square Ball where they were talking about um, they only had one media officer at one point and uh, there, there was an occasion where a certain important piece of news couldn't get shared because the media officer was on holiday, which just seems absolutely extraordinary when you consider the hundreds, you know, how much money is involved with Leeds United and the Premier League. Lots of issues like that that just make me think that the, the structural issues have been neglected and maybe um, Radrazani was after the quick buck of being able to sell the club when it was in the Premier League and not necessarily had much of a, a clue to the club's long-term interests. Yeah, yeah, certainly legitimate. I mean, I'm not. I don't want to come across as some sort of Radrazani stan because I'm not. Sure. I don't have any. I don't have any loyalty to to him as a person. Um, my loyalty is to Leeds. Sure. Um, I, I suppose what I'm saying is, it, you know, I agree with what you said. I think towards the end, he a sale was agreed. So the sale was already agreed if we stayed up, and they had to sort of re negotiate upon relegation so maybe there was this winding down period where he did start to neglect the club uh slightly and, and decisions became more rash um i still stand by what i've said i mean we are where we are the club's been sold hopefully to bidders that now do have a more positive mindset and do want to grow the club i mean the west ham needs revamping as well i mean th there's work to be done on the stadium that seemed to get spoken about and then just get thrown away and never discussed again despite the money so he's met he has made money there's no doubt about that i suppose the only point that i'm trying to make in, in one way is that i think the club's in a decent position now and it's in a position that's better than it was six years ago um sure. that doesn't mean there isn't work to be done <laughs> yeah of course no, i think there yeah. is <laughs> Yeah, of course. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, talk to me about the appointment of Daniel Tharka, Ryan. How are you feeling about that one? Oh, I I agree with what you said in terms of is the club aligned to make Farker work. So it, it's it's difficult to know, but I think in terms of pedigree and his his sort of CV, there couldn't have been many sort of more qualified candidates um you know they, it's kind of refreshing to see that we've not gone so far left field this time um in many ways because it felt like we went through a period of a point in you know managers like thomas christensen who were always going to be fairly big punts given the the experience that they'd had where they where they could work but you sort of knew in the back of your mind that they probably wouldn't because it was a big step up for them so I like the fact that he's had this experience, not just with Norwich, but with Munch and Gladbach as well. Um, you know, only one year. It seems fairly unreasonable to criticise him too much for, I mean, I'm not a Munch and Gladbach fan and I, I believe there's some that don't like him and, and all the rest of it, but they were mid-table the year before he got there and they were mid-table the year that he was there. I mean, it's sort of... Um, fairly harsh so I, i'm quite positive about it and he, one thing i will say is that he forgetting the tactics for a moment which are massively important i do think it's important at the minute for the fans to actually like the person that's speaking on behalf of Leeds united because bringing in sam allardyce as a last ditch attempt to make sure that you don't lose your money and you want to stay up 
you're willing to sort of pay him four million on the off chance that you earn fifty. I mean, that wasn't an appointment for Leeds. That was an appointment for Radrazani. Mm. And that was like polar opposite to what we had with Bielsa. Um, so I think it's important that the person that's in charge is someone that we actually like, that is positive, sure. that we can get behind and that has some sort of clear vision for what he wants the squad to look like. Yeah, absolutely. It feels a little bit like that's um, that's a way off right now. And that's the slight concern that I have, because as much as we've joked about, you know, the fact that Leeds, yeah, you're, you're not expecting to challenge for the top two. I feel like there will be a proportion of, fan, but, of fans that, that probably do expect that. Um, and yet I'm not sure that the squad's necessarily going to be 100% in line with, with what Farker wants. So that's going to be an interesting dynamic. Um so Ryan, in um, a couple of weeks, I've got to predict my one to twenty fours. Um, <laughs> what will be the reason for me to be really optimistic about Leeds United this season? There's there's talent in the squad and in the attacking areas. The talent is there. I think whoever they decide to sell, there's goals in the team already, and that is before they sign a new striker, which could be Joel Perot. That's before. They sign a new central midfielder, who could be Gustavo Hamer from Coventry. And that's before they sign a new left-back, who could be Ryan Manning. So I think the, the squad is probably three or four good signings away from you and I having a very different perspective on the outcome of the team. Um, yeah. It's hard for us today to sit here and say, how are Leeds going to do 1-24? to I don't know. I don't know. And, and there's a lot of uncertainty. And probably for that reason alone, I'd advise you to put us no higher than about sixth. You know, that, and that's the way that I feel about it. <laughs> okay. You know, I just, there's too many questions. There's too many. I don't know what the style will look like. I don't know who he fancies to fit in with the style. I don't know. Certainly central midfield is a huge worry for me. You know, if Adams stays, great. But even then, it's Adams and Giabi or Adams and yeah. what. And then, and then we get down to like Shackleton and, and Greenwood mm. and Dallas. And they're, they're players that, they're peripheral players. I think they need more bona fide championship stars. Well, and more technical players as well, which is uh, which is a big thing for me because Certainly. I think in front of an, especially Ellen Road, in front of an expectant crowd, Leeds are going to play a really patient game. And I think there's going to be a bit of edginess if you're trying to play that patient game with players who aren't necessarily 100% comfortable playing it, um, where you almost have the opposite of the of the rocker sort of It's going situation. to be so interesting, though, Gab, because literally we started last season with a manager who wanted us to play without the ball. He, he wanted the opposition to have the ball and for us to press and to win it back high up. And, and we were just pushing the ball back to the opposition. So now we're completely changing that and saying right we want to play with the ball and the expectation will be not just attacking as you're saying it will be possession based it will be a lot calmer it will be technical that's a big change over the course of one summer and let alone over the course of three weeks yeah yeah, huge, huge shift. Uh, hopefully, Farker can uh, can pull it off. And I suppose that that kind of feeds into my my next question, which is the reason to be cautious. And I, you've kind of already answered it. It's it's the unknowns. It's the, the stylistic shift. It's whether Farker has the personnel to execute the style of football that he wants. Um, hopefully, he can do that. But it feels like um, a, a bit of a transitional season is ahead, and that's going to be really interesting because I think there will be an element of expectation in there as well. Um, Ryan, thanks so much for your time. It's been lovely to chat Leeds with you uh, this evening. And um, yeah, hopefully catch you at a game at some point next season. I'll be around. I'm not totally negative, by the way. I do I do think that we... Uh, <laughs> you never know. Elland Road's a strange place. It can go from misery and darkness to very quickly becoming very positive and everyone wants to be there every other weekend so um i'll tell you what once you once you make those three signings tomorrow you'll be texting me saying we're gonna win the league <laughs> absolutely yeah we'll we do the video again tomorrow <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, i actually i hope they sign hamer actually that's one that i really hope they i mean that would be an incredible statement and we spoke about where are they going to put their eggs i'd prefer they spent more money on hamer and then got sam surridge for example um, than put all their eggs into Joel Perot. And I, I just think that Hamer would actually, if he was playing alongside Adams, 
Uh, I think that would immediately make me think, actually, maybe we can do something this season. <laughs> Just think. Do you know, I still think, though, if you signed Hamer, I still think you'd need a conductor at the base of midfield to play the way Hamer likes. Um, Farker likes. I think Hamer's a bit more of an eight. He's very well, good with likes. A bit yeah. further forward. I mean, the whisper at the minute is, I mean, again, you know more than me. There are whispers of Sam Field at West Brom, who I don't know oh, QPR, about. QPR. Uh, QPR, sorry, yeah. Oh, that's interesting, because he's another one that's a real runner and he tries really hard, but he's not necessarily that technical. I'm not, oh, I'm not just, sure he'd be. Just end this now before okay, I... Uh, <laughs> we're, we're, back in, we're back in 10th place. <laughs> 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 Leeds are falling apart again. No, um, <laughs> no, we'll see. We'll see who they go for. Uh, thanks so much for your time, Ryan. Thanks, thanks to you for watching at home. This has been EFL Debate, the Leeds United Summer Deep Dive with Ryan Owen, and we'll see you again very soon.